On November 5, 1872, a determined woman entered a voting center in Rochester, New York, and committed an act of legal defiance that would shake the nation. She voted. In a time when women were denied a voice in their own government, the simple act of voting made her a criminal. Yet to thousands of people across the country, both women and men, she was a hero of courage and vision. Her name was Susan B. Anthony. Her arrest and trial would cause enormous controversy. She became a centerpiece in one of the most important political revolutions in history, the struggle to win voting rights for women. Among all the leaders of this monumental 70-year campaign, Susan B. Anthony stands first. For over half a century, she patiently endured threats and ridicule, traveling thousands of miles in her tireless quest for reform. In an age when women enjoyed few basic rights and freedoms, she defied the belief that women should be seen and not heard, fought powerful organizations, faced angry mobs, suffered humiliating personal attacks, even risked her life, and yet never retreated from her long struggle to succeed. Hers was not a simple battle of the sexes, but a relentless campaign to gain rights for all. Her pioneering efforts helped found America's first civil rights movement, blazing a trail that would be followed by countless others in the years to come. From her humble Quaker origins, Susan B. Anthony rose to become one of the most charismatic and influential women in American history. Susan B. Anthony is my hero. She and her colleagues, but she was the leader. They were responsible for virtually every right we have as women today. There's just nothing that we could do if they hadn't been there first and done it first. She uh, was a great inspirational leader. She uh, rallied hundreds of thousands of women. She pushed on in her 70s, in her 80s. She shows a persistence and um, a greatness that is an inspiration. And it should be available. The, the story is there, and it, it just hasn't been told enough. I think that every February 15th, women in this country should pause, recognize that is Susan B. Anthony's birthday, and just for a second, say thank you. Susan Brownell Anthony was born on February 15, 1820, in the small town of Adams, Massachusetts, the second child of Daniel and Lucy Reed Anthony. Five more brothers and sisters followed, and it was in this large, tightly knit New England household that Susan's early personality was formed. It was here that she developed the deep attachments to home and family that she carried throughout her life. Her feelings were touchingly expressed in a poem written when she was 14. What so sweet, so beautiful on earth, and oh so dear as kindred love and family repose. While each one loves one little spot in which your heart unfolds, one sweet spot, and calls it home. Susan B. Anthony was very close with her family. Um, that's where I think she found the inner strength to go on with her work. And although she traveled most of the time um, during her life, she always came home uh, for the warmth and the, the comfort of the fireside, you know, the family hearth. She took her position as the second oldest of seven children very seriously. If someone was sick, one of the sisters or brothers, she traveled to their side to care for them. Susan's father was a devout Quaker, but he also had a reputation for being an independent thinker, of following the inner light even when it went against the grain of the accepted Quaker belief. There was a near scandal when he married Lucy Reed, a pretty and vivacious farm girl who was a Baptist. But Daniel stuck to his guns and the local Quaker congregation finally accepted the marriage. To ease her acceptance, Lucy resolved to give up the colorful clothes, the singing and dancing, that had been so important in her life because they were considered ungodly by the stern Quakers. Though she was said to have a beautiful voice, she never sang again after her marriage, not even to her babies. Lucy's inner discipline and Daniel's stubborn adherence to principles would influence Susan B. Anthony's character throughout her life. The America in which Susan was born was very much a frontier society. The Revolutionary War had been fought only 38 years before. 
Large-scale Indian wars were still raging in the southeastern wilderness, and the nation's western border was the Mississippi River. It was a rough and tumble world, a man's world. Women had very few legal or political rights. After marriage, a woman virtually ceased to exist in legal terms, having no power to enter into contracts, to buy or sell property in her own name, or to obtain a divorce without her husband's consent. And without the power to vote, women lacked the power to control their lives. They were dependent on men. However, there was a new spirit in the air. In 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected president, a rough and tumble frontiersman and general. His presidency emphasized the rights of the common man. As this big idea was accepted by the young nation, women were inspired to believe that they too could rise above their restricted life to fulfill a virtually unlimited future. She does represent uh, a sort of female version of the Jacksonian Revolution. The the idea of becoming self-supporting, of making a living, of being uh, someone who could support herself and be independent both economically and then of course politically I think was extremely inspiring to her. Now this is the nugget of the Jacksonian Revolution or the Jacksonian mindset, but um, what she did is transfer it from men to women and in that small change she worked a revolution. The Quaker belief that women were equal to men before God also helped to shape young Susan. Quakerism absolutely molded this woman. She went to a Quaker meeting where her aunt preached equally with the men. This was a very, very strong signal to her that women were equal to men, and, and she never saw things any differently. This was unheard of in the early 1800s. In the Quaker meeting house, men and women spoke equally. And so Susan B. Anthony thought that that's the way it was everywhere uh, until she tried to speak in public as a woman. And then she found that it was not acceptable. Uh, she first spoke at uh, a temperance meeting, and when she uh, tried to speak, she was told that the sisters were there to learn and listen. Of course, she stormed out. <laughs> Another early influence on Susan was the Quaker belief that all children, both girls and boys, receive an education. In a time when only a few visionaries felt that women should be educated at all, this was extraordinary. In her early days, of course, she was in a, in a one-room schoolhouse, and um, she was very bright, learned her adding and subtracting and approached her teacher, to, wouldn't he give her some problems in division because she really wanted to learn it. And just give me some sample pro um, problems and, and I'll work on them on my own. And the teacher refused. He said there's no reason that a girl will ever need to know division. Daniel Anthony pulled his children out of class and began educating them at home. Susan loves studying and learning. And in 1837, when she was 17, her father sent her off to join her older sister at a Quaker boarding school for young women near Philadelphia. It was her first trip far from home, and it was a tough experience. For months, she was tormented by intense feelings of homesickness. Ironically, Susan was destined to spend most of her life away from home in seemingly endless travel. Just as Susan started to adjust to life at school, however, her whole world was turned upside down when a sudden economic depression swept the nation. The so-called Panic of 1837 ruined her father's business. The Anthony home and all the family's personal belongings had to be auctioned off. She poured out her feelings in her diary. Can I ever be reconciled to such a change? Can I ever forget that loved residence and no more call it home? It seems impossible. With her father no longer able to afford her $125 a year tuition, Susan returned to her family. Desperate to help ease their financial burden, she took a teaching position in New Rochelle, New York, sending money home whenever she could. When the family's economic problems eased somewhat, the young Miss Anthony began to develop a social life. She enjoyed going to parties where, despite an awkwardness, she liked to dance. Perhaps influenced by her mother's non-Quaker upbringing, she sometimes put aside her strict gray dresses for lively plaids, gingham bonnets, and lace cuffs. Soon, the young men of the area began to take notice of the handsome young schoolmarm. There is plenty of evidence that Susan B. Anthony had a lot of suitors as a young woman. Her diaries are filled with notations about getting her hair braided and, and new dresses, and she was very proud of her new dresses. 
Um, and you can just see her sort of fluttering her eyelashes and, and getting on her purple plaid dress, which she writes about uh, for one event, uh, one carriage ride with a young man. She did not hate men. She rather liked young men. She enjoyed their company. And all of her life, she had very close men friends. She was opposed to marriage uh, because of what she saw, the legal bondage in which it put women. Later in life, she would write, What do I think of marriage? True marriage, the real marriage of souls, when two people take each other on terms of perfect equality, without the desire of one to control the other, is a beautiful thing. It is the highest condition of life. But for a woman to marry for support is demoralizing. And for a man to marry a woman merely because she has a beautiful figure or face is a degradation. Susan loved teaching and excelled at it. She was appalled, however, when she learned her salary was only one-fourth of what the man before her had made. But the idea of women's rights had not yet formed in her mind. She was far more concerned about the biggest issue of the day, slavery. In 1845, when the economy got better, the Anthonys bought a farm near Rochester, New York. Now able to live at home again, 25-year-old Susan and her family were caught up in the local anti-slavery movement. Her father held meetings at their home and Susan began reading William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator. These activities opened up a whole new world to her. It was in the farm home right outside of Rochester, New York, where um, every Sunday anti-slavery meetings were held. And that's where Susan B. Anthony met Frederick Douglass, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips. Um, all the great reformers of the day were meeting right in her family home. So reform was no new idea to Susan B. Anthony. Her later efforts to raise the status of women would grow from the same sense of outrage that inspired her to campaign against slavery. Her participation in the anti-slavery movement, uh, which preceded her women's rights activity, is absolutely crucial. From her parents, from her Quaker parents, she had developed deeply abolitionist convictions, and she wanted to play a role in uh, ridding her country of this terrible burden and emancipating, uh, emancipating the slaves. However, Susan B. Anthony's first fight for reform was against drinking. Her Quaker upbringing made her strongly disapprove of alcohol, and the temperance movement was one of the few places where women played a significant, although secondary, role. When she found a job teaching in a nearby town, she joined the local chapter of the Daughters of Temperance and quickly became one of its most outspoken and influential members. Energized by her work in the movement and feeling a deep need to correct the injustices of society, Susan decided to give up teaching and devote the rest of her life to the cause of reform. And in 1851, at the age of 31, she met the woman who, more than any other, would give her work shape and direction, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth had organized the first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848, issuing a declaration that proclaimed the full equality of women, including the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony was in uh, Seneca Falls for a temperance meeting, another one of her causes against alcohol, and she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the street. And both of them recall that they liked each other right away. They looked nothing alike. I think of them as the indivisible odd couple of the women's movement. There was Stanton, short, plump, curly white hair with a brood of children. Susan B. Anthony was tall, slim, her gray hair pulled back in a bun, never married. Um, they were so different in so many ways, and yet they were really two brains in search of one goal, and that goal was women's rights. I think both of their skills were crucial to building an enormous movement out of nothing from scratch. Um, Stanton had the sort of intellectual vision, she had the way with words, she, and Anthony had from the beginning the vision of what it meant to build a movement. She methodically was an organizer of women. First she started with the temperance movement and she traveled relentlessly around uh, the United States, reaching other women, bringing them the power of her own uh, personal conviction and passion. With Elizabeth's encouragement, Susan decided to add women's rights to her growing list of causes. Soon she began speaking and lecturing around the state of New York, campaigning for reform. She often traveled alone on these trips, 
something that women simply did not do at that time. The day is very cold, snowy, slaying very poor. Saturday went to Oleon, could not get a church, schoolhouse, or academy to speak in. Held meeting in a dining room of landlord. Once Susan arrived at a courthouse for a meeting to find that the only one there was the janitor. Determined, she sat down and waited until a few curious onlookers arrived, then began her speech. She covered her expenses by charging a 25 cent admission and by selling women's rights literature, all the time keeping careful accounts of every penny she spent. Despite her love for colorful clothes, Susan always wore plain black during her appearances so as not to distract her listeners from her message. Other feminists had been ridiculed when they adopted loose-fitting trousers, called bloomers, instead of traditional dress, and Susan herself had worn the costume. However, it was not right for the image she was creating, and she eventually gave it up. Her one dash of color was a red shawl. Susan B. Anthony really had a couple of, of trademarks, um, <clears throat> one with her red shawl. And uh, well, Susan B. Anthony was very savvy as far as um, uh, well, communications go. I mean, she just about talked in sound bites, I think, when she was around the media. And she traveled actually faster than the news. So whenever she came into town, the media would come and meet her at the train station to find out what was going on in another part of the country. But her red shawl uh, is something that she wore because it attracted attention and it became the symbol of the suffrage movement, but mostly of Susan B. Anthony. She appeared in front of every Congress from 1869 until 1906, the year she died, when she was 86 years old. And they had a saying in Washington that spring was no longer heralded in by the red-breasted robin, but by the red shawled Susan on the steps of the Capitol. Susan's speaking style was simple and direct. The true woman will not be the exponent of another or allow another to be such for her. She will be her own individual self, do her own individual work, stand or fall by her own individual wisdom or strength. Woman, equally with man, was made for her own individual happiness, to develop every talent given her by God in the great work of life, to the best advantage of herself and the race. In the 1850s, this was a radical position. And at first, resistance to Susan's message was enormous. Women's rights advocates were looked upon as crazy outsiders by mainstream society. Susan often spoke before audiences where drunken hecklers outnumbered her supporters. It was a grueling fight, both physically and emotionally. Dear Mrs. Stanton, there is so much midst all that is hopeful to discourage and dishearten. I sometimes fear that I too shall faint by the wayside and drop out of the ranks of the faithful few. But with Elizabeth's support, Susan never gave up. Elizabeth wrote, Courage, Susan. I glory in your perseverance. I will do anything to help you on. Susan was attacked in the press as a strident spinster, lean and cadaverous in appearance. In reality, she had a lively sense of humor and loved to play charades. You know, Susan B. Anthony had that naturally turned down mouth. And the way photography was in those days, people just didn't smile in photographs, you know, because you had to hold your pose for so long. And so we have an image of, of this very stern, um, very prim woman, and, and she was, you know, she was a very prim woman. Um, but she was very warm, and uh, in reading things that friends of hers and co-workers uh, have written. I mean, she was so warm. And he, they'd say, oh, and she opened the door and there was that big, wonderful smile of hers. Unlike most other women's rights crusaders, including Mrs. Stanton, who married and raised families, Susan made a conscious decision to remain single so she could better devote her time to the cause of empowering women. There was loneliness. There is evidence in her diary and in her letters that she was very lonely, that she did suffer plenty for being single all of her life. But she had very close family members. She had very, very close friends, men and women, and her work really kept her going. Though this intense focus on her work sometimes grew tiresome to her friends, she never lacked a rich personal life. She stayed close to her family, nurturing loving relationships with her parents, brothers and sisters and became almost a second mother to Elizabeth's children, 
She also served as a mentor to a whole army of younger women who entered the growing movement. Women like Anna Howard Shaw and Carrie Chapman Catt. As a woman without her own children, she virtually adopted a whole generation of young women uh, who were suffrage activists who called her Aunt Susan and um, who she called her nieces. With her increasing skills as a public speaker and her tireless efforts on behalf of women's rights, Susan's cause slowly gathered momentum as her personal image grew. Her expanding army of supporters often greeted her with a flurry of waving handkerchiefs, the so-called Chautauqua salute, which the women of the day considered more ladylike than loud hand clapping. Despite Susan's gains, however, by 1860, there was still only one issue that was on Americans' minds, slavery. Even the staunchest women's rights supporters knew at this time their most pressing goal was to join hands with the anti-slavery movement to win freedom for African Americans. There's a very simple entry, nothing more, in one of her diaries. It was 1861, and she's at home, and she talks about being out in the orchard and tending to the fruit and tending to the plants. And then she says very casually, fitted out a slave for the Underground Railroad with the help of Harriet Tubman. Now, that's fabulous. Harriet Tubman, of course, the great the engineer in the Underground Railroad, was her friend, and she worked with her. One of the most touching aspects of that relationship, I think, is reflected in a church in Rochester. It's an AME church, an African-American church, and in there is a stained glass window with Susan B. Anthony's image on it, and that window was the very first tribute ever erected to Susan B. Anthony right after she died. So the African-American community in her hometown honored her before anyone else. Realizing that the country's future was at stake, Susan followed the presidential election of 1860 with great interest. Susan B. Anthony was so vehemently anti-slavery, she even opposed Abraham Lincoln's election because she thought he didn't go far enough. Um, and indeed, many people felt that way on his first, uh, when he first ran for office, that um, he wasn't nearly strong enough. So she went on a speaking tour, and the subject of that speaking tour was no compromise with slaveholders. She felt Lincoln was compromising. Um, she was so detested for that, it was a very radical position, that one winter, she, her body was actually burned in effigy while she was on a tour in upstate New York. A truly horrifying experience. The body was burned and then dragged through the streets. She was often escorted by police, and in Albany she spoke on stage with the mayor himself seated beside her with a pistol in his lap. During this crusade, Susan worked in close cooperation with William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and other important abolitionists. But within a few years, a serious disagreement would arise, one that would open a rift between the anti-slavery and women's rights movements that would never be completely healed. As the Civil War broke out, Susan B. Anthony gave speech after speech, trying to gain support for a law to end slavery. During all her campaigns, she was often encouraged by her father, a pillar of strength who continued to foster her drive and nurture her inquisitive mind. When he died at the age of 69 of an unidentified stomach ailment in the autumn of 1862, Susan was shattered. It seemed that everything in the world must stop. I felt alone. I doubt if there is any mortal who clings to loved ones with greater tenacity than do I. Even President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation a few months later could not lift her spirits. Yet despite her terrible loss, she knew her work had to continue. Soon, Susan and Elizabeth set to work drawing up another petition. They hoped to broaden the limited Emancipation Proclamation, outlawing slavery throughout the United States by means of a constitutional amendment. As the bloody Civil War dragged on, the physical danger became greater than ever before. When a military draft law was passed, citizens in New York City rioted in the streets. Many immigrant workers were furious that they were being forced to fight and die for the freedom of Negroes. Despite their fear during these times, Susan and Elizabeth acquired over 400,000 signatures. And in the spring of 1864, the 13th Amendment was passed by the U.S. Senate. It was the beginning of the end of slavery in America. Just one year later, the Civil War ended when Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. 
However, the rejoicing turned to tragedy a few days afterwards when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Susan interpreted the president's death as an act of God. Was there ever a more terrific command to a nation since the world began? The old book's terrible exhibitions of God's wrath sink into nothingness. With the ratification of the 13th Amendment by the required three-quarters of the states, Susan now joined the effort for another amendment to extend voting rights to all U.S. citizens. She wanted to include women in the proposed 14th Amendment. However, many of her abolitionist friends and some women's rights leaders believe that insisting on the vote for women would detract from the more pressing issue of African-American voting rights. Wendell Phillips wrote, while I continue arguing for women's rights, just as I do for temperance, still I would not mix the movements. I think such a mixture would lose for the Negro far more than we should gain for the women. This attitude infuriated Susan. She believed that the right to vote should be extended to everyone. Disfranchisement in a republic is as great an anomaly, if not cruelty, as slavery itself. These people, these abolitionists, when they started, they were doing something unbelievably radical. I don't think any of them ever thought that slavery would be ended in their lifetimes or ended by the kind of conflagration that the Civil War represented. I think this gave uh, Anthony uh, the conviction that you could take um, a sort of moral vision, a vision of, of profound social transformation, one that, was, that barely anyone else in the society shared, and you could hold on to it and fight for it and you could actually win it. Despite her passionate pleas and lengthy petitions, Susan and her allies could not change the framework of the 14th Amendment. It was a giant step backwards for women's rights and a major disappointment for Susan. Her experience in the temperance movements and anti-slavery movements taught her something about what she wanted to direct her efforts on. And that was that without a political voice, sh she could cause change in, in a very, very slow way. Uh, she could collect signatures, um, thousands of, hundreds, millions of signatures, but if it didn't represent votes, it didn't mean anything in Washington as far as changing the law. And um, this is something that once she realized, she focused her efforts on the vote, and I think that was part of, uh, well, that was her brilliance. Susan studied the Constitution and now decided to take her fight to the states where there were no specific provisions denying women the vote. The early part of 1872 found Susan B. Anthony on the road again, campaigning all across the country for the women's vote. Six months of constant travel, a full 8,000 miles and 108 lectures. The year's full work, 13,000 miles travel and 170 meetings. In the autumn of 1872, the 52-year-old Susan was finally back at her home in Rochester, but it was hardly for a rest. She was planning to commit an act that would send shockwaves throughout the nation. On November 1, 1872, Susan left her house on 17 Madison Street with her three sisters and walked to the local barber shop where, as usual, eligible men were being registered to vote. She demanded to be registered herself. She insisted that since she was a U.S. citizen, she had the right to vote under the 14th Amendment. One clause of the 14th Amendment excludes women by uh, defining the basis of representation as male persons over the age of 21. Another clause in the 14th Amendment seems very much to include them, and that's the first clause of the 14th Amendment, which defines national citizenship. And it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens thereof and have all the rights and privileges of citizenship. When the election inspectors refused, Susan hit them with an ultimatum. If you refuse us our rights as citizens, I will bring charges against you in criminal court, and I will sue each of you personally for large exemplary damages. Intimidated by her forceful challenge, the inspectors gave in. Susan and her sisters were registered. Susan's goal was simple, to force a case before the Supreme Court that would decide once and for all if the 14th Amendment should extend to women. Early in the morning on November 5th, Susan B. Anthony and her followers went to the polls and voted. You can catch her passion because it's in her letters. Um, in her, le her letters are always full of underlinings. They're sort of, you can hear her sort of yelling. <laughs> 
After casting the ballot, Susan returned home and wrote Elizabeth in triumph. Well, I've gone and done it. Positively voted the Republican ticket straight. Not a jeer, not a look disrespectful has met a single woman. I hope the morning's telegrams will tell of many women all over the country trying to vote. I hope you voted too. The incident quickly escalated into a national sensation. Susan and her followers in Rochester were jailed and charged with voting illegally. It was just what Susan wanted. If they lost in the local court, it would lead directly to a showdown in the United States Supreme Court. She figured, I think correctly, that decisions had been made at the very highest level of the Grant administration to pursue this case. That unless it was stopped, in fact, they were going to have voting women on their hands. The judge who sat on her case was actually a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. He was riding circuit. Judge Hunt was a recent Republican appointee to the U.S. Supreme Court, one of the nine justices of the Supreme Court, and sits on her case. Released on $1,000 bail, Susan B. Anthony was brought to trial on June 17, 1873, at the Village Courthouse in Canandigua, New York. Before a courtroom packed with press and spectators from all over the country, the presiding judge, Ward Hunt, called the trial to order. As was customary at the time, Susan's jury of peers consisted of 12 men. When Susan's lawyer, Henry Selden, tried to call her as a witness in her own defense, Judge Hunt promptly ruled that she was unable to appear because she was a woman. Then after listening to the evidence, he pulled a paper out of his pocket and began reading an opinion which had obviously been prepared in advance. Said Hunt, The 14th Amendment gives no right to a woman to vote, and the voting of Miss Anthony was in violation of the law. He then directed the jury to bring in a verdict of guilty a highly unusual action in a criminal case. When an outraged Selden protested, demanding that the jury members be asked individually, Hunt refused, saying, The question, gentlemen of the jury, is wholly a question of law, and I have decided that the result must be a verdict on your part of guilty. Her trial was such a travesty of justice that... Um, it's really unbelievable when you consider that it was Susan B. Anthony who was very well known across the country already. There was a former president of the United States in the courtroom, uh, Millard Fillmore, and uh, there were congressmen. But anyway, uh, even though this was a situation of these very important people in the courtroom and the eyes of the country on the courtroom, still Susan B. Anthony was not allowed to speak in her own defense. The onlooker sat in stunned silence as Hunt ordered Susan to stand. He solemnly asked her if she had anything to say before he pronounced her sentence. Yes, Your Honor, I have many things to say. For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. The judge impatiently ordered the prisoner to sit down, but Susan ignored him. My natural rights, my political rights, my judicial rights are all alike ignored. Robbed of the fundamental privilege of citizenship, I am degraded from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. When she was finished, Judge Hunt boomed out his verdict. The sentence of the court is that you pay a fine of $100 and the costs of prosecution, or serve 10 days in jail. Anthony was indignant. May it please your honor, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. I shall earnestly and persistently continue to urge all women to the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Hunt replied, Madam, the court will not order you to stand committed until the fine is paid. The statement was as illogical as it was contradictory. Hunt was threatening Susan with jail only if she obeyed his ruling. However, there was a well-thought-out plan behind his actions. If he had ordered Susan to be imprisoned until the fine was paid, she could have immediately appealed his decision to the Supreme Court. Now, that option was far more difficult. Although Susan was free, she had effectively lost any reasonable opportunity to bring a landmark case before the highest court in the land. Now. The trial was rigged. Um, she lost. Her vote didn't count, but she got great publicity value out of it. Uh, in fact, after the trial, she got the transcript printed up, thousands of them, and she would distribute them all over the country. So in the long run, 
what it did was create headlines and create a lot of sympathy uh, for the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony had become a force to be reckoned with on a national level. For the next several years, Susan campaigned from state to state, returning to Washington every spring to attend the National Women's Rights Convention and put more pressure on Congress to pass a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage. These were years filled with difficult work and also with tragedy. In 1877, Susan's younger sister Hannah dies of tuberculosis. And in 1880, she lost her 86-year-old mother to complications of old age. Yet Susan fought on. Susan B. Anthony always said that um, any praise given to her should be shared with her sister Mary, because Mary is the one who really enabled her to do her work. Mary is the one who made sure the bills were all paid at home. Um, Mary is the one that made sure that every cent wasn't spent on the movement. Uh, Mary was uh, the beacon at home. By 1890, the crusade for American women had grown tremendously. During its 40 years of existence, the women's rights movement had been transformed from a fringe group led by a few radical activists into a widespread effort that included the mainstream of society. And the cause became worldwide when Susan traveled to Europe and helped organize the first International Council of Women. Now the elder leaders of the movement, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were among the handful of leaders who had been through it all. They had achieved extraordinary accomplishments during their four decades of effort. Many states had changed their laws regarding property rights for married women, allowing them to own property and enter into contracts without their husband's approval. There had also been a virtual revolution in education. When Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820, there wasn't a single institute of higher learning that accepted women. Now, as the century was drawing to a close, women were accepted at well over half of the colleges, universities, and professional schools in America. And yet there was not one single state in the union that allowed women to vote. Then, in March of 1890, 70-year-old Susan B. Anthony sat in the gallery of the U.S. House of Representatives to observe a historic event, the vote that admitted Wyoming to the United States. In 1869, while still a territory, Wyoming had given rights to women. Now, it had entered the Union as the only state to allow women to vote. It was the first major victory for women's suffrage. By the time of her 75th birthday in 1895, Susan B. Anthony had become a legend. Her life is a, uh, represents an arc. At the beginning of her uh, career, um, of her dedication to women's rights, she was much despised, and she writes about how painful this was to her because what, one of the things she brought to the women's movement was a tremendous faith. Um, she had many disappointments in her life, but one, one of her um, achievements, I think, has to be that by, uh, by the end of her life, she was deeply respected as a representative woman, as an embodiment of, of what women had become in the 19th century. At her birthday celebration in St. Louis, Susan was caught by surprise when a procession of 75 children, black and white, filed past her, each laying a single rose in her lap. More battles had been won since the Wyoming victory, but still only a few states allowed women to vote. When Susan suffered a mild stroke at age 80, she sensed she would not live to see her dream of a constitutional amendment fulfilled. Yet even after the devastating loss in 1902 of Mrs. Stanton, who died at 87 after a long series of ailments, Susan never stopped working toward her goal. Susan B. Anthony was one of the most famous people in her day. Uh, newspaper headlines identified her merely as Susan B. That's how well known she was. Um, her presence guaranteed the success of an event. She took tea with Queen Victoria in England. Um, she was invited to the White House regularly. In November 1905, in failing health, 85-year-old Susan B. Anthony traveled to the White House. The woman who had battled with Lincoln over the issue of slavery nearly 50 years before was going to a face-to-face -face meeting with the most imposing political figure of the new century, President Theodore Roosevelt. Susan knew that Roosevelt was a vigorous reformer, a man who believed in a square deal for all. Yet on the question of women's suffrage, he had remained strangely silent. Mr. Roosevelt, this is my principal request. It is almost the last request I shall ever make of anybody. 
before you leave the presidential chair, recommend a constitutional amendment which will enfranchise women and thus take your place in history with Lincoln, the great emancipator. I beg of you not to close your term in office without doing this. The president gave a polite but vague answer and did nothing. Susan remained optimistic. On her 86th birthday, now frail and in very poor health, she addressed a convention honoring the College Women of America. If any proof were needed of the progress of the cause for which I have worked, it is here tonight. The presence on stage of these college women and in the audience of all these college girls who will someday be the nation's greatest strength tell their story to the world. A few days later, Susan sat quietly at a small birthday celebration as her friends and colleagues paid tribute to her. Finally struggling to stand, she thanked them all for their loyal support. Then she looked off into the distance and said, Failure is impossible. They were the last words she ever spoke in public. Not long afterward, she suffered a bout of double pneumonia. She recovered, but her heart was fatally weakened. And on March 13, 1906, Susan B. Anthony slipped away quietly at the age of 86. Fourteen years after her death, Susan B. Anthony's prophetic words, failure is impossible, were proven true. On June 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, dubbed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment in her honor, was finally ratified. Five months later, millions of women across the United States stepped into voting booths for the first time to help choose their nation's president. Susan B. Anthony, uh, I mean, her whole story of her life and work um, just give you strength, I think. With all the setbacks, she just pushed on. She had an incredible persistence, a power of leadership, a great organizer, but she had the ability to inspire people. I think I've almost never missed a chance to vote. She helps me to retain the sense that political empowerment is fundamental, uh, both for me as a woman and for America as a democracy. She was so brave and so bold and so forthright at a time when it was so very, very difficult to be any of those things. And by the way, she did it for us. She was perfectly aware it might not happen in her lifetime. She knew she was doing it for future generations. A poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Susan kept pasted on the first page of her diary, perhaps best reflected her feelings. Labor with what zeal we will, something still remains undone, till at length it is or seems greater than our strength can bear as the burden of our dreams, pressing on us everywhere. <laughs>